energy, simply energy. Define and describe work. Define and describe power. State two forms of mechanical energy. State three forms of potential energy. Describe how work and kinetic energy are related. State the work energy theorem. State the law of conservation of energy. Describe how a machine uses energy. Explain why no machine can be 100% efficient. Describe the role of energy in living organisms. The big idea, energy can change from one form to another without net loss or gain. Energy is the most central concept underlying all of science. Surprisingly, the idea of energy was unknown to Isaac Newton, and its existence was still being debated in the 1850s. Even though the concept of energy is relatively new, today we find it ingrained not only in all branches of science, but in nearly every aspect of human society. We are all quite familiar with energy. Energy comes to us from the sun in the form of sunlight. It is in the food we eat and it sustains life. Energy may be the most familiar concept in science, yet it is one of the most difficult to define. We begin our study of energy by observing a related concept, work. Again, energy can change from one form to another without a net loss or gain. Where does a popper toy get its energy? Turn a popper, slice of a hollow rubber ball, inside out and place it on the table or floor. Observe what happens to the popper toy. Once again, compress the popper and drop it onto the table. Observe what happens to the popper. What propelled the popper into the air? It's observing, predicting. Will dropping the popper from greater heights make the popper jump higher? Explain. Making generalizations. Describe where the popper got the energy to move upward and downward through the air. 9.1 Work. The previous chapter showed that the change in an object's motion is related to both force and how long the force acts. How long meant time. Remember the quantity force times time is called impulse. But how long need not always mean time. It can mean distance also. When we consider the quantity force times distance, we are talking about the concept of work. Work is the product of the net force on an object and the distance through which the object is moved. We do work when we lift a load against Earth's gravity. The heavier the load or the higher we lift it, the more work we do. Think. Suppose that you apply a 60 Newton horizontal force to a 32 kilogram package which pushes it four meters across the metal floor. How much work do you do on the package? Work equals force times distance, which equals 60 newtons times four meters, which equals 240 joules. Work is done when a force acts on an object and that object moves in the direction of the force. Remember, work is force times distance. Let's look at the simplest case in which the force is constant and the motion takes place in a straight line in the direction of the force. Then the work done on an object by an applied force is the product of the force and the distance through which the object is moved. Work equals net force times distance. In equation form, it's W equals FD, or work equals force times distance. If we lift two loads up one story, we do twice as much work as we would in lifting one load the same distance. 
because the force needed to lift twice the weight is twice as great. Similarly, if we lift one load two stories instead of one story, we do twice as much work because the distance is twice as great. Notice that the definition of work involves both a force and a distance. The weight lifter in 9.1 is holding a barbell weighing 1,000 newtons over his head. He may get really tired holding it, but if the barbell is not moved by the force he exerts, he does no work on the barbell. Figure 9.1. Work is done in lifting the barbell, but not in holding it steady. If the barbell could be lifted twice as high, the weightlifter would have to do twice as much work. Work may be done on the muscles by stretching and squeezing them, which is force times distance on a biological scale. But this work is not done on the barbell. Lifting the barbell, however, is a different story. When the weightlifter raises the barbell from the floor, he is doing work on it. Work generally falls into two categories. One of these is the work done against another force. When an archer stretches her bowstring, she is doing work against the elastic force of the bow. Similarly, when, when, ram, when the ram of a pile driver is raised, work is required to raise the ram against the force of gravity. When you do push-ups, you do work against your own weight. You do work on something when you force it to move against the influence of an opposing force, often friction. The other category of work is work done to change the speed of an object. This kind of work is done in bringing an automobile up to speed or in slowing it down. In both cases, work involves a transfer of energy between something and its surroundings. The unit of measurement for work combines a force, N, and a unit of distance, D, or meters. The resulting unit of work is Newton meters, N, M, also called the Joule, rhymes with cool, in honor of James Joule. The physics of a weightlifter holding a stationary barbell overhead is no different than, a physics, than the physics on a table supporting a barbell weight. No net force acts on the barbell, no work is done on it, and no change in its energy occurs. One joule of work is done when a force of one newton is exerted over a distance of one meter as in lifting an apple over your head. For larger values, we speak of kilojoules, kj, thousands of joules, or megajoules, millions of joules. The weightlifter in figure 9.1 does work on the order of kilojoules. To stop a loaded truck going at 100 kilometers per hour takes megajoules of work. When is work done on an object? 9.2, power. The definition of work says nothing about how long it takes to do the work. When carrying a load up some stairs, you do the same amount of work whether you walk or run up the stairs. So why are you more tired after running upstairs in a few seconds than after walking upstairs in a few minutes? To understand this difference, we need to talk about how fast the work is done or power. Power is the rate at which work is done. Power equals the amount of work done divided by the time interval during which the work is done. Power equals work done divided by time interval. A high power engine does work rapidly. An automobile engine that delivers twice the power of another automobile engine does not necessarily produce twice as much work or go twice as fast as the less powerful engine. Twice the power means the engine can do twice the work in the same amount of time or the same amount of work in half the time. A powerful engine can get an automobile up to a given speed 
in less time than a less powerful engine can. The unit of power is the joule per second, also known as the watts, W-A-T-T, in honor of James Watt, the 18th century developer of the steam engine. One watt of power is expended when one joule of work is done in one second. One kilowatt equals 1,000 watts. One megawatt equals 1 million watts. The space shuttle in 9.2 uses 33,000 megawatts of power. In the United States, we customarily rate engines in units of horsepower and electricity in kilowatts, but either may be used. In the metric system of units, automobiles are rated in kilowatts. One horsepower is the same as 0.75 kilowatts. So, an engine rated at 135 horsepower is a 100 kilowatt engine. Concept check. How can you calculate power? Figure 9.2, the three main engines of the space shuttle can develop 33 million megawatts of power when fuel is burned at the enormous rate of 3,400 kilograms per second. This is like emptying an average sized swimming pool in 20 seconds. Think. If a forklift is replaced with a new forklift that has twice the power, how much greater a load can it lift in the same amount of time? If it lifts the same load, how much faster can it operate? The forklift that delivers twice the power will lift twice the load in the same time, or the same load in half the time. 9.3 Mechanical Energy When work is done by an archer in drawing back a bowstring, the bent bow acquires the ability to work on the arrow. When work is done to stretch a rubber band, the rubber band acquires the ability to do work on an object when it is released. When work is done to wind a spring mechanism, the spring acquires the ability to do work on various gears to run the clock, ring a bell, or sound an alarm. In each case, something has, acquired, has been acquired that enables the object to do work. It may be in the form of compression of atoms in the material or an object, a physical separation of attracting bodies, or a rearrangement of electrical charges in the molecule of a substance, the property of an object or system that enables it to do work is energy. What happens when you do work on sand? Pour a handful of sand into a can. Measure the temperature of the sand with a thermometer. Remove the thermometer and cover the can. Shake the can vigorously for a minute or so. Now remove the cover and measure the temperature of the sand again. Describe what happens to the temperature of the sand after you shook it. Think, how can you explain the temperature, the change in temperature of the sand in terms of work and energy? Like work, energy is measured in joules. It appears in many forms that will be discussed in the following chapters. For now, we will focus on mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is the energy due to the position of something or the movement of something. The two forms of mechanical energy are kinetic energy and potential energy. How does the area of contact affect the pressure a force exerts on an object? 9.4 Potential Energy An object may store energy by virtue of its position. Energy that is stored and held in readiness is called potential energy, PE, because, because in the stored state it has the potential to do work. Three examples of potential energy are elastic potential energy, chemical potential energy, and gravitational potential energy. What tells you whether or not work is done on something is the change in its energy. 
No change in energy means that no net work was done on it. Elastic potential energy. A stretched or compressed spring, for example, has a potential for doing work. This type of potential energy is elastic potential energy. When a bow is drawn back, energy is stored in the bow. The bow can do work on the arrow. A stretched rubber band has potential energy because of its position. If the rubber band is part of a slingshot, it is also capable of doing work. Chemical energy. The chemical energy in fuels is also potential energy. It is actually energy of position at the microscopic level. This energy is available when the positions of electrical charges within and between molecules are altered. That is when a chemical change takes place. Any substance, substance that can do work through chemical reactions possesses chemical energy. Potential energy is found in fossil fuels, electrical batteries, and the food we eat. Gravitational potential energy. Work is required to elevate objects against Earth's gravity. The potential energy due to elevated positions is gravitational potential energy. Water in an elevated reservoir and the raised ram of a pile driver have gravitational potential energy. The amount of gravitational potential energy possessed by an elevated object is equal to the work done against gravity in lifting it. The work done equals the force required to move it upward times the vertical distance it is moved. Remember, work equals force times distance. The upward force required while moving a constant velocity is equal to its weight, mg, of the object. So the work done in lifting it through a height, h, is the product mgh. Gravitational energy equals weight times height. PE equals MGH. Remember, MG is weight. Note that the height is the distance above some arbitrarily chosen reference level, such as the ground or the floor of a building. The gravitational potential energy, MGH, is relative to that level and depends only on MG and H. For example, if you're in a third-story classroom and a ball rests on the floor, you can say the ball is at height zero. Think. You lift a 100 Newton boulder one meter. A. How much work is done on the boulder? A point to ponder. Work equals force times distance equals 100 newton meters equals 100 joules. 100 times 1 is 100 joules or 100 newton meters. You lift a 100 newton boulder 1 meter. What power is expended if you lift the boulder in a time of 2 seconds? Remember. Power is a rate, so it's 100 joules divided by 2 seconds equals 50 watts. That's capital W, named after James Watts. 50 watts. You lift 100 newton boulder 1 meter. What is the gravitational potential energy of the boulder in the lifted position? C. The answer. It depends. Relative to its starting position, the boulder's PE is 100 joules. Relative to some other reference level, its PE would be some other value. Lift it and it has positive PE relative to the floor. Toss it out the window and it has negative PE relative to the floor. We can see in figure 9.3 that the potential energy of the boulder on the top of the ledge does not depend on the path taken to get there. Hydroelectric power stations make use of gravitational potential energy. When a need for power exists, water from an upper reservoir flows through a long tunnel 
in an electric generator. Gravitational potential energy of the water is converted to electrical energy. Most of this energy is delivered to consumers during daylight hours. A few power stations buy electricity at night when there is much less demand. They use this electricity to pump water from a lower reservoir back up to the upper reservoir. Figure 9.3, the potential energy of the 100 newton boulder with respect to the ground below is 200 joules. In each case, because the work done in elevating it 2 meters is the same whether the boulder is A, lifted with 100 newtons of force, B, pushed up the 4 meter inclined plane, 50 newtons of force, or C, lifted with 100 newtons of force up each 0.5 meter stair. No work is done in moving it horizontally, neglecting friction. This process called pumped storage is practical when the cost of electricity is less at night. Then electrical energy is transformed to gravitational potential energy. Although the pump storage system doesn't generate any overall net energy, it helps to smooth out differences between energy demand and supply. Notes, when H is below a reference point, PE is negative relative to that reference point. Name three examples of potential energy. 9.5 kinetic energy. Push on an object and you can set it in motion. If an object is moving, then it is capable of doing work. It has energy of motion, or kinetic energy, Ke. The kinetic energy of an object depends on the mass of the object as well as its speed. It is equal to half the mass multiplied by the square of the speed. Kinetic energy equals one-half mass times velocity squared, or speed squared. Kinetic energy equals one-half mv squared. When you throw a ball, you do work on it to give it speed as it leaves your hand. The moving ball can then hit something and push it, doing work on what it hits. The, the kinetic energy of a moving object is equal to the work required to bring it to its speed from rest or the work the object can do while being brought to rest. Refer to note 9.5 in Appendix G. For the derivation of the equation, W equals delta Ke. Net force times distance equals kinetic energy. Force times distance equals one-half mv squared. Note that the speed is squared, so if the speed of an object is doubled, its kinetic energy is quadrupled. 2 squared is 4. Consequently, it takes 4 times the work to double the speed. Also, an object moving twice as fast takes 4 times as much work to stop. Whenever work is done, energy changes. How are work and kinetic energy of a moving object related? The sweet spot. Physics of sports. The sweet spot of a softball bat or a tennis racket is the place where the ball's impact produces minimum vibrations in the racket or bat. Strike a ball at the sweet spot and it goes faster and farther. Strike a ball in another part of the bat or racket and the vibrations can occur that sting your hand. From an energy point of view, there is energy in the vibrations of the bat or racket. There is energy in the ball after being struck. Energy that is not in vibrations is energy available to the ball. Do you see why a ball will go faster and farther when struck at the sweet spot? 9.6 Work Energy Theorem. So, you can see that to increase the kinetic energy of an object, work, work must be done on it. Or, if an object is moving, 
work is required to bring it to rest. In either case, the change in kinetic energy is equal to the work done on it. The work energy theorem describes the relationship between work and energy. The work energy theorem states that whenever work is done, energy changes. We abbreviate change in with the delta symbol delta. It's a capital Greek letter, the capital delta. And we say work equals delta Ke, or work equals the change in kinetic energy. Think. A friend says that if you do 100 joules of work on a moving cart, the cart will gain 100 joules of kinetic energy. Another friend says, well, this depends on whether or not there is friction. What is your opinion on these statements? Careful. Although you do 100 joules of work on the cart, this may not mean the cart gains 100 joules of kinetic energy. How much kinetic energy the cart gains depends on the network done on it. Work equals change in kinetic energy. The work in this equation is the net work. That is, the work based on the net force. The work energy theorem emphasizes the role of change. If there is no change in an object's kinetic energy, then we know no work was done on it. Push against the box on the floor. If it doesn't slide, then you are not doing work on the box. Put the box on a very slippery floor and push again. If there is no friction at all, the work of your push times the distance of your push appears as kinetic energy of the box. If there is some friction, it is the net force of your push minus the frictional force that is multiplied by distance to give the gain in kinetic energy. If the box moves at a constant speed, you are pushing just hard enough to overcome friction. Then the net force and net work are zero, and according to the work energy theorem, delta Ke equals zero. The kinetic energy doesn't change. The work energy theorem applies to decreasing speed as well. The more kinetic energy something has, the more work is required to stop it. Twice as much kinetic energy means twice as much work. When we apply the brakes to slow a car or the bike in figure 9.4, we do work on it. This work is the frictional force applied by the brakes multiplied by the distance over which the friction force acts. Interestingly, the maximum friction that the brakes can supply is nearly the same whether the car moves slowly or quickly. In a panic stop with anti-lock brakes, the only way for the brakes to do more work is to act over a longer distance. Figure 9.4. Due to friction, energy is transferred both into the floor and into the tire when the bicycle skids to a stop. A. An infrared camera reveals the, the heated tire track on the floor. And B. The warmth of the tire is also revealed. A car moving at twice the speed of another has four times as much kinetic energy and will require four times as much work to stop. Since the frictional force is nearly the same for both cars, the faster one takes four times as much distance to stop. The same rule applies to older, older model brakes that can lock the wheels. The force of friction on a skidding tire is also nearly independent of speed. Automobile brakes convert Ke to heat. Professional drivers are familiar with another way to brake shift to a lower gear and let the engine slow the vehicle. Hybrid cars similarly divert braking energy to stored energy in batteries. Typical stopping distances for cars equipped with anti-lock brakes traveling at various speeds. The work done to stop the car is friction force times distance, 
or the frictional force times distance of slide. So, an accident investigators are well aware an automobile going 100 kilometers per hour with four times the kinetic energy it would have at 50 kilometers per hour skids four times as far with the wheels locked as it would with the speed of 50 kilometers per hour. Figure 9.5 shows the skid distance for a car moving at 45, 90, and 180 kilometers per hour. The distances would be even greater if the driver's reaction time were taken into account. Kinetic energy depends on speed squared. Kinetic energy also appears hidden in different forms of energy, such as heat, sound, light, and electricity. Random molecular motion is sensed as heat. Sound consists of molecular vibrations or vibrating and rhythmic patterns. Even light energy originates in the motion of electrons within atoms. Electrons in motion make electric currents. We see that electric energy plays a role in other electric forms. Concept check. What is the work energy theorem? Here is a model and the caption from another book says, atoms and molecules had long been theorized as the constituents of matter. And Albert Einstein published a paper in 1905 that explained in precise detail how the motion that Brown had observed, Brownian motion, was a result of the pollen being moved by individual water molecules, making one of his first big contributions to science. When the brakes of a car are locked, the car skids to a stop. How much farther will the car skid if it's moving three times as fast? Nine times farther. The car has nine times as much kinetic energy when it's traveled three times as fast. One half m3v squared or, one, or nine times one half mv squared. 9.7, conservation of energy. More important than knowing what energy is, is understanding how it behaves, how it transforms. We can understand nearly every process that occurs in nature if we analyze it in terms of transformation of energy from one form to another. As you draw back the arrow in a bow, as shown in 9.6, you do work stretching the bow. When released, potential energy will become the kinetic energy of the arrow. That's figure 9.6. The bow then has potential energy. When released, the arrow has kinetic energy equal to this potential energy. It delivers this energy to its target. The small distance the arrow moves multiplied by the average force of impact doesn't quite match the kinetic energy of the target. But if you investigate further, you'll find that both the arrow and the target are a bit warmer. By how much? By the energy difference. Energy changes from one form to another without a net loss or a net gain. The study of the various forms of energy and the transform transformations from one form into another is the law of conservation of energy. The law of conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can be transformed from one form to another, but the total amount of energy never changes. Links to chemistry reactions. What process provides energy for rockets that will lift the space shuttle into orbit? What process releases energy from the food we eat? The answer is chemical reactions. During a chemical reaction, the bonds between atoms break and then reform. Breaking bonds requires energy, and forming bonds releases energy. Pulling atoms apart is like pulling apart two magnets stuck together. 
It takes energy to do it. And when atoms join, it is like two separated magnets that slam together. Energy is released. Rapid energy release can produce flames. Slow energy release occurs during the digestion of food. The conservation of energy rules chemical reactions. The amount of energy required to break chemical bond is the same amount released when that bond is formed. Figures 9.7 and 9.8 demonstrate conservation of energy in two different systems. When you consider any system in its entirety, whether it is as simple as the swinging pendulum or as complex as an exploding galaxy, there is one quantity that does not change, energy. Energy may change form, but the total energy score stays the same. The energy score takes into account the fact that each atom that makes up matter is a concentrated bundle of energy. When the nuclei, cores of the atom, rearrange themselves, enormous amounts of energy can be released. The sun shines because some of its nuclear energy is transformed into radiant energy. In nuclear reactions, nuclear energy is transformed into heat. Enormous compression due to gravity in the deep, hot interior of the sun causes hydrogen nuclei to fuse and become helium nuclei. Figure 9.7. Part of the potential energy of the wound spring changes into kinetic energy. The remaining potential energy goes into heating the machinery and the surroundings due to friction. No energy is lost. Not figure 9.8. Everywhere along the path of a pendulum bob, the sum of potential energy and kinetic energy is the same. Because of the work done against friction, this energy will eventually be transformed into heat. This high temperature welding of atomic nuclei is called thermonuclear fusion and will be covered later in chapter 40. This process releases radiant energy, some of which reaches Earth. Part of this energy falls on plants, and some of the plants later become coal. Another part supports life in the food chain that be, begins with microscopic marine animals and plants and later gets stored in oil. Part of the sun's energy is used to evaporate water from the oceans. Some water returns to Earth as rain that is trapped behind a dam. By virtue of its elevation, elevated position, the water behind the dam has stored potential energy that is used to power a generating plant below the dam. You see where it says <clears throat> the microscopic marine animals and plants and later stored in oil. Many, many millions of years ago, you had plankton, uh, plant plankton, and uh, it was enormous in the sea. And that plankton died and went to the bottom of the sea. And that eventually, over millions and millions of years, became petroleum, oil, that is uh, mined and taken out of the earth and used in a variety of things, in car engines, as gasoline, petrol, plastics, etc. Figure 9.9. .9. When the woman in distress leaps from the burning building, note that the sum of her potential and kinetic energy remains constant at each success position all the way down to the ground. The generating plant transforms the energy of falling water into electrical energy. Electrical energy travels through wires to homes where it is used for lighting, heating, cooking, and operating electric toothbrushes. How nice that energy is transformed from one form to another. Concept check. What does the law of conservation of energy state? 9.8 machines. A machine is a device used to multiply forces or simply to change the direction of forces. The concept that underlies every machine is the conservation of energy. A machine cannot put out more energy than is put into it. A machine cannot create energy. 
a machine transfers energy from one place to another or transforms it from one form to another. Levers or levers. Consider one of the simplest machines, the lever, shown in figure 9.10. Figure 9.10. The lever, the work force times distance done at one end is equal to the work done on the load at the other end. A lever is a simple machine made of a bar that turns about a fixed point. At the same time, we do work on one end of the lever. The other end does work on the load. We see that the direction of force is changed. If we push down, the load is lifted up. If the heat from friction is small enough to neglect, the work input will equal the work output. Since work equals force times distance, we say force times distance input equals force times distance output. A little thought will show that the pivot point, or fulcrum, of the lever can be relatively close to the load. Then a small input force exerted through a large distance will produce a large output force over a correspondingly short distance. In this way, a lever can multiply forces. However, no machine can multiply work or energy. That's a conservation of energy no-no. Consider the ideal weightless lever in figure 9.11. The child pushes down 10 newtons and lifts an 80 newton load. The ratio of output force to input force for a machine is called the mechanical advantage. Here the mechanical advantage is 8 newtons divided by 10 newtons, or 8. Notice that the load moves only one-eighth of the distance the input force moves. Neglecting friction, the mechanical advantage can also be determined by the ratio of input distance to output distance. Figure 9.11. The output force 80 newton is 8 times the input force 10 newtons, while the output distance 1 eighth meter is 1 eighth of the input distance, one meter. Three common ways to set up a lever are shown in figure 9.12. A type 1 lever has the fulcrum between the force and the load, or between input and output. This kind of lever is commonly seen in a playground seesaw with children sitting on each end of it. Push down on one end and you lift a load on the other. You can increase force at the expense of distance. Note that the directions of input and output are opposite. For a type 2 lever, the load is between the fulcrum and the input force. To lift the load, you lift the end of the lever. One example is placing one end of a long steel bar under an automobile frame and lifting on the free end to raise the automobile. Again, force on the load is increased at the expense of distance. Figure 912, the three basic types of levers are shown here. Notice that the direction of the force is changed in type 1. Since the input and output forces are on the same side of the fulcrum, the forces have the same direction. In the type 3 lever, the fulcrum is at one end and the load at the other. The input force is applied between them. Your bicep muscle are connected to a bone in your forearm in this way. The fulcrum is your elbow and the load is in your hand. The type 3 lever increases distance at the expense of force. When you move your bicep muscle a short distance, your hand moves a much greater distance. The input and output forces are on the same side of the fulcrum and therefore they have the same direction. Pulleys. A pulley is basically a kind of lever that can be used to change the direction of a force. 
Properly used, a pulley or system of pulleys can multiply forces. The single pulley in figure 9.13a behaves like a type 1 lever. The axis of the pulley acts as the fulcrum, and both lever distances, the radius of the pulley, are equal, so the pulley does not multiply forces. It simply changes the direction of the applied force. In this case, the mechanical advantage equals 1. Notice that the input distance equals the output distance the load moves. In figure 9.13b, the single pulley acts as a type 2 lever. Careful thought will show that the fulcrum is at the left end of the lever where the supporting rope makes contact with the pulley. The load is suspended halfway between the fulcrum and the input end of the lever, which is on the right end of the lever. Figure 9.13, a pulley is useful. A, a pulley can change the direction of the force. B, a pulley multiplies force, or C, two pulleys can change the direction and multiply the force. Each newton of input will support two newtons of load, so the mechanical advantage is two. This number checks with the distances moved. To raise the load one meter, the woman will have to pull the rope up two meters. We can say the mechanical advantage is two for another reason. The load is now supported by two strands of rope. This means each strand supports half the load. The force the woman applies to support the load is therefore only half of the weight of the load. The mechanical advantage for simple pulley systems is the same as the number of strands of rope that actually support the load. In figure 9.13a, the load is supported by one strand and the mechanical advantage is one. In figure 9.13b, the load is supported by two strands and the mechanical advantage is two. Can you use this rule to state the mechanical advantage of the pulley system in figure 9.13c? The mechanical advantage of the simple system in figure 9.13c is 2. Notice that although three strands of rope are shown, only two strands actually support the load. The upper pulley serves only to change the direction of the force. Actually, experimenting with a variety of pulley systems is much more beneficial than reading about them in a textbook. So, try to get your hands on some pulleys in or out of class. They're fun. The pulley system shown in figure 9.14 is a bit more complex, but the principles of energy conservation are the same. When the rope is pulled 5 meters with a force of 100 newtons, a 500 newton load is lifted one meter. Figure 9.14, a complex pulley system, is shown here. Remember, 100 newton pull, 500 newton lift, 5 to 1. The mechanical advantage is 500 newtons to 100 newtons, or 5. Force is multiplied at the expense of distance. The mechanical advantage can also be found from the ratio of distances. Input distance to output distance equals 5. Notes. A machine can multiply force, but never energy. No way. How does a machine use energy? 9.9. .9, efficiency. The previous examples of machines were considered to be ideal. All the work input was transferred to work output. An ideal machine would have 100% efficiency. No real machine can be 100% efficient. In any machine, some energy is transformed into atomic or molecular kinetic energy, making the machine warmer. We say this wasted energy is dissipated as heat. When a simple lever rocks about its fulcrum or a pulley turns about its axis, a small fraction of input energy is converted into thermal energy. The efficiency of a machine is the ratio of useful energy output to total energy input, or the percentage of the work input 
that is converted to useful work output. Efficiency can be expressed as the ratio of useful work output to total work input. Efficiency equals useful work output divided by total work input. We may put in 100 joules of work on a lever and get out 98 joules of work. The lever is then 98% efficient and we lose only 2 joules of work input as heat. In a pulley system, a larger fraction of input energy is lost as heat. For example, if we do 100 joules of work, the friction on the pulley as they turn and rub on their axle can dissipate 40 joules of heat energy. So the work output is only 60 joules and the pulley system has a efficiency of 60%. The lower the efficiency of a machine, the greater is the amount of energy wasted as heat. Inclined planes. An inclined plane is a machine. Sliding a load up an incline requires less force than lifting it vertically. Figure 9.15 shows a 5 meter inclined plane with its high end elevated by 1 meter. Using the plane to elevate a heavy load, we push the load 5 times farther than we lift it vertically. If friction is negligible, we need apply only one-fifth of the force required to lift the load vertically. Pushing the block of ice five times farther up the incline than the vertical distance it's lifted requires a force of only one-fifth its weight. Whether pushed up the plane or simply lifted, the ice gains the same amount of potential energy. The inclined plane shown has a theoretical mechanical advantage of 5. An icy plank used to slide a block of ice up to some height might have an efficiency of almost 100%. However, when the load is a wooden crate sliding on a wooden plank, both the actual mechanical advantage and the efficiency will be considerably less. Friction will require you to exert more force, a greater work input, without any increase in work output. Efficiency can also be expressed as the ratio of the actual mechanical advantage to theoretical mechanical advantage, which is the equation efficiency equals actual mechanical advantage divided by theoretical mechanical advantage. Efficiency will always be a fraction less than 1. To convert efficiency to percent, we simply express it as a decimal and multiply by 100%. For example, an efficiency of 0.25 expressed in percent is 0.25 times 100% or 25%. Complex machines. The auto jack shown in figure 9.16 is actually an inclined plane wrapped around a cylinder. You can see that a single turn of the handle raises the load a relatively small distance. If the circular distance the handle is moved is 500 times greater than the pitch, which is the distance between ridges, then the theoretical mechanical advantage of the jack is 500. No wonder a child can raise a loaded moving van with one of these devices. The auto jack is like an inclined plane wrapped around a cylinder. Every time the handle is turned one revolution, the load is raised a distance of one pitch. In practice, there is a great deal of friction in this type of jack, so the efficiency might be about 20%. Thus, the jack actually multiplies force by about 100 times. So the actual mechanical advantage approximates an impressive 100. Imagine the value of one of these devices if it had been available when the Great Pyramids were being built. An automobile engine is a machine that transfers chemical energy stored in fuel into mechanical energy. The molecules of the gasoline break up as the fuel burns. Burning is a chemical reaction in which atoms combine with the oxygen in the air. 
carbon atoms from the gasoline combine with oxygen atoms to form carbon dioxide. Hydrogen atoms combine with oxygen and energy is released. The converted energy is used to run the engine. Think. A child on a sled, total weight 500 newtons, is pulled up a 10 meter slope that elevates her a distance of 1 meter. What is the theoretical mechanical advantage of the slope? Think answer. The ideal or theoretical mechanical advantage is input distance divided by output distance, which equals 10 meters over 1 meter, which equals 10. As physicists learned in the 19th century, transforming 100% of thermal energy into mechanical energy is not possible. Some heat must flow from the engine. Friction adds more to the energy loss. Even the best designed gasoline-powered automobile engines are likely to be more than 35% efficient. Some of the heat energy goes into the cooling system and is released through the radiator to the air. Some of it goes out the tailpipe with the exhaust gases, and almost half goes into heating engine parts as a result of the friction. On top of these contributions to inefficiency, the fuel does not burn completely. Notes. When it comes to energy, you can never get something for nothing. A certain amount of it goes unused. We can look at inefficiency in this way. In any transformation, there is a dilution of the amount of useful energy. Useful energy ultimately becomes thermal energy. Energy is not destroyed. It is simply degraded. Though heat transfer, thermal energy is the graveyard of useful energy. Energy is nature's way of keeping score. Why can't a machine be 100% efficient? 9.10 Energy for Life Every living cell in every organism is a machine. Like any machine, living cells need an energy supply. Most living organisms on this planet feed on various hydrocarbon compounds that release energy when they react with oxygen. There is more energy stored in gasoline than in the products of its combustion. There is more energy stored in the molecules food is metabolized. The energy difference sustains life. The same principle of combustion occurs in the meta metabolism of food in the body and the burning of fossil fuels in mechanical engines. The main difference is the rate at which the reactions take place. During metabolism, the reaction rate is much slower and energy is released as it is needed by the body. Like the burning of fossil fuels, the reaction is self-sustaining once it starts. In metabolism, carbon combines with oxygen to form carbon dioxide. The reverse process is more difficult. Notes. In biology, you'll learn how the body takes energy from the food you eat to build molecules of adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, and how this supply of ATP is used to run all the chemical reactions that sustain life. Only green plants and certain one-celled organisms can make carbon dioxide combined with water to produce hydrocarbons compounds such as sugar. This process is photosynthesis and requires an energy input which normally comes from sunlight. Sugar is the simplest food. All other foods such as Carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are also synthesized compounds containing carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and other elements. Because green plants are able to use the energy of sunlight to make food that gives us and all other organisms energy, there is life. What role does energy play in sustaining life? 9.11 Sources of Energy the sun is the source of practically all our energy on Earth. Exceptions are nuclear and geothermal. The sun is the source of practically all our energy on Earth. Worth repeating. The energy from burning wood comes from the sun. Even the energy we obtain from Earth 
Earth's compost of the past, fossil fuels such as petroleum, coal, and natural gas come from the sun. These fuels are created by photosynthesis, the process by which plants trap solar energy and store it as plant tissue. Solar power. Sunlight is directly transformed into electricity by photovoltaic cells like those found in solar powered calculators or more recently in the flexible solar shingles on the roof of the building in figure 9.17. We use the energy in sunlight to generate electricity indirectly as well. Sunlight evaporates water which later falls as rain. Rainwater flows into rivers and turns water wheels or it flows into modern generator turbines as it returns to the sea. Wind caused by unequal warming of Earth's surface is another form of solar power. The energy of the wind can be used to turn generator turbines within specially equipped windmills. Figure 9.17 Solar shingles look like traditional asphalt shingles but they are hooked into a home's electrical system. Because wind is not steady, wind power cannot by itself provide all our energy needs. But because the wind is always blowing somewhere, windmills spread out over a large geographical area and integrated into a power grid can make a substantial contribution to the overall energy mix. Harnessing the wind is very practical when the energy it produces is stored for future use, such as in the form of hydrogen. Fuel cells. Hydrogen the least polluting of all fuels, holds much promise for the future because it takes energy to make hydrogen to extract it from water and carbon compounds. It is not a source of energy. A simple method to extract hydrogen from water is shown in figure 9.18. Place two platinum wires that are connected to the terminals of an ordinary battery into a glass of water with an electrolyte dissolved in the water for conductivity. Remember, pure water is not conductive. Be sure the wires don't touch each other. Bubbles of hydrogen form on one wire and bubbles of oxygen form on the other. Electricity splits water into its constituent parts. If you make the electrolysis process run backwards, you have a fuel cell. In a fuel cell, hydrogen and oxygen gas are compressed at electrodes to produce water and electric current. The space shuttle uses fuel cells to meet its electrical needs while producing drinking water for the astronauts. Nine, uh, figure 9.18 when electric current passes through water, bubbles of hydrogen form at one wire and bubbles of oxygen form at the other. In a fuel cell, the reverse process occurs. Hydrogen and oxygen combine to produce water and electricity. Here on Earth, fuel cell researchers are developing fuel cells for buses, automobiles, and trains. Nuclear and geothermal energy. The most concentrated form of usable energy is stored in uranium and plutonium, which are nuclear fuels. Interestingly, Earth's interior is kept hot by producing a form of nuclear power, radioactivity, which has been with us since the Earth was formed. A byproduct of radioactivity in the Earth's interior is geothermal energy. Geothermal energy is held in underground reservoirs of hot water. Geothermal energy is a practical energy source in areas of volcanic activity such as Iceland, New Zealand, Japan, and Hawaii. In these places, heated water near Earth's surface is tapped to provide steam for running turbo generators. Energy sources such as nuclear, geothermal, wind, solar, and water power are environmentally friendly. The combustion of fossil fuels, on the other hand, 
leads to increased atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and other pollutants. As the world population increases, so does our need for energy. Notes. Watch for the growth of fuel cell technology. The major hurdle for this technology is not the device itself, but with acquiring hydrogen fuel economically. One way is via solar cells. With the rules of physics to guide them, technologists are now researching newer and cleaner energy sources, but they race to keep up with world population and greater demand in the developing world. Concept check. What is the source of practically all of our energy on Earth? Energy conservation, science, technology, and society. Most energy consumed in America comes from fossil fuels. Oil, natural gas, and coal supply the energy for almost all our industry and technology. About 70% of electrical power in the United States comes from fossil fuels, with about 21% from nuclear power. Worldwide, fossil fuels also account for most energy consumption. We have grown to depend on fossil fuels because they have been plentiful and inexpensive. Until recently, our consumption was small enough that we would ignore their environmental impact, but things have changed. Fossil fuels are being consumed at a rate that threatens to deplete the entire world supply. Locally and globally, our fossil fuel consumption is measurably polluting the air we breathe and the water we drink. Yet, despite these problems, many people consider fossil fuels to be as inexhaustible as the sun's glow and as acceptable as mom's apple pie because these fuels lasted and nurtured us through the 1900s. Financially, fossil fuels are still a bargain, but this is destined to change. Environmentally, the costs are already dramatic. Some other fuels must take the place of fossil fuels if we are to maintain the industry and technology to which we are accustomed. The French have chosen nuclear, with about 74% of their electricity coming from nuclear power plants. What energy source would you choose as an alternative? In the meantime, we shouldn't waste energy. As individuals, we should limit the consumption of useful energy by such measures as turning off unused electrical appliances, using less hot water, going easy on heating and air conditioning, and driving energy-efficient automobiles. By doing these things, we are conserving useful energy, critical thinking. In how many reasonable ways can we reduce energy consumption? Summary, energy. Work is done when a force acts on an object and the object moves in the direction of the force. Power equals work divided by time. The two forms of mechanical energy are kinetic energy and potential energy. Three examples of potential energy are elastic potential energy, chemical energy, and gravitational potential energy. The kinetic energy of a moving object is equal to the work done on it. The work energy theorem states that whenever work is done, energy changes. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. A machine transfers energy from one place to another or transforms it from one form to another. In a machine, some energy is transformed into atomic kinetic energy. There is more energy stored in the molecules in food than there is in the reaction products after the food is metabolized. The energy difference sustains life. The sun supplies most of Earth's energy.